Hello world, it's Angelot. I'm here with part two of the map time SF D3.geo talk that I gave. Um, in the last video, I went over all the examples, and uh, this video, we're going to go through the data. So, what I've done is prepare several data sets. Each one is um, in the topo JSON format, which I talked a little bit about in the last video. But it's basically the JavaScript um, format that we want our geographic data to be in. So here, I'm, uh, as an example, just loading the topo JSON for the world landmass boundaries into the browser and logging out uh, that data into the console so we could look at it, for example. And um, we see that it's just... Um, Topo JSON, it's not really human readable in the sense that you just look at this and say, oh, that's the world. But um, this is what we need to give to D3 so that it can draw some nice paths for us. And what I want to do is kind of show examples uh, where uh, each of these data sets is used and take you through the code briefly. I won't be coding it live in this video, but we'll just go through existing examples so that you can kind of take those, play with them on your own time. Um, and I'll just try to point out the sort of essential pieces that, that let you put it together. Uh, I've gone ahead and, and opened all these links and tabs already since my internet's kind of slow right now. You know, Comcast, what are you going to do? Uh, so you can load the JSON. I could have showed it like this. It's, a, it's actually just a text file. Uh, it looks like this. Um, and what you want to be able to do is give, your, give that to your JavaScript. Um, in tributary, I've loaded the JSON in this tab, and it's, it's kind of a lot of text, so it slows everything down when you do that. It's something I need to fix, but um, for now, you just need to know that that is accessible as JSON um, on the tributary object because of the file in here. And if we look at uh, what that is, we should see the same thing. Yeah, see, there's the arcs and the transform, all that stuff that we saw in the uh, other page. So I just want to show quickly how this gets turned into uh, the SVG we see before us. And let's make sure that this path here covers uh, the, the globe and the graticule or those lines behind it. Um, so what happens, the main thing that happens is we specify a projection. So these are a couple other projections we could use. Um, but mainly, um, right now we're using an orthographic projection. We specify the scale, which is you know, how big and, and small you want it to be. Or in some senses, if we were to use something like Mercator, how zoomed in you are. Right? This is uh, what we're used to is zooming in and out. Uh, let me put it back to orthographic. We can also rotate this globe on different axes. And rotation on a 3D globe kind of makes sense in each of these ways, right? Let me put it back to zero, and you'll see um, in Mercator, this is like what Google Maps uses. That makes sense. Let's see if this sort of makes sense. I'm twisting things. This one's pretty interesting. So yeah, projections are basically how we try to uh, fit a 3D globe onto a 2D screen, right? And so D3 has a number of ways of, of doing that. Albers is a very American-centric, uh, if you rotate it properly, uh, it makes America look really good, but the rest of the world gets kind of squished. Um, and clip angle is uh, not something you always want to mess with. I just keep it at 90 degrees. Um, I think if we don't specify, oh well. I guess um, for the orthographic, it makes a lot of sense if we play with this clip angle to see. Like it kind of clips out um, at 90 degrees, it like stops halfway. Otherwise, we can see the countries on the other side of the globe. Um, and it messes with the rendering. If we don't do this and we do Mercator, 
You kind of see the whole earth, yeah. All right, so that's projections. We take the projection and we create a D3 geopath function. Uh, this is essentially a function that's going to take in uh, some some JSON uh, or like a feature from the topo JSON and draw something from it. It can also take uh, a graticule, which is um, something provided by D3 to draw these lines. Uh, so this is going to be a form of um, GeoJSON or TopoJSON as well that gets rendered um, into a path. And then here, we're directly calling the path function and passing in countries. We could also do that datum countries and pass in path like that, and we get the same code working, right? Um, there's two ways uh, to, to do it. Alright, so that's the basic globe. I also want to show, um, you know, counties is the kind of thing that, you know, this is California counties, but you might have population data or census data by county and you want to show, you know, map that directly. So this example shows how to draw the, you know, it's the same setup with the data, uh, the projection, and we um, render the, cal the the counties as paths, uh, but this is going to be a path for each county. And if we had more data to go with that, which we will in other examples, um, we could color them individually. That, or we can um, draw points, which is another thing I want to show. So there's an airport uh, JSON here, which this is the county, the airports are over here, so if we click this, these are a bunch of points, uh, and each one has this set of data with it. And here we can see some numbers and some, you know, some qualitative data, um, like categorical data, like the city, what kind of uh, land use you know it is. We can also see um, some other uh, data attributes that we might want to visualize. And so in in the um, Airports example here, we might um, link up the airports with a table, um, you know, and then we could also size them by one of those those values or do something. Uh, likewise, in this this example here, we have the amount of debris projected um, to happen. If I go to this example, I have open here. Each county, you know, this was part of a hackathon for uh, earthquake simulation or, you know, getting people to think about uh, solutions for problems that might happen after a big earthquake, which San Francisco sits on two fault lines where the Bay Area does, and uh, it's kind of bound to happen at some point. So this is showing a lot of debris um, in these areas will, will be caused by the earthquake in this, in this model, like it's a prediction kind of thing. Um, and I think that's the total and there's like bricks and wood versus concrete damage uh, which varies slightly between these areas but uh, for whatever reason these are uh, really vulnerable counties um, so yeah we're gonna go over how to uh, do these things the other thing I didn't show is that both the airport and the earthquake map are using leaflet and so they're powered behind you know this map with uh, the city names and all that is rendered by uh, the stamen tiles. So um, then we're layering D3 for these uh, airport uh, things or for these counties here uh, on top of that. And so, and that's all you know connected by leaflet, powered by leaflet. So we'll look at the source and see how that happens. So yeah, actually let's uh, go ahead and, and check out. Uh, so I'm just gonna, you know, that's view developer view source. I just open that up. Um, we see a normal HTML file. We have D3. We include the Topo JSON library. We include Leaflet, and then this comes from Stamen's tile. Uh, it, this uh, brings up their tiles. Uh, if you go to Stamen's, uh, I think it's maps.stamen.com. Uh, they'll, they'll give you the info for embedding or using uh, Stamen maps. You know, one of these on your site. Alright. 
So yeah, we have a little bit of styling, which we'll get to when we render that stuff. We make a div for the map, a div for the table, um, you know, some div to to describe, just a little text or whatever. But then the script starts. So we chose a bounding box to cover the Bay Area. Um, these are just you know latitude, longitude that I found through uh, actually copying an example from someone else, or like you can also find it by using Google Maps or, or whatever to to get this area. And I create a, a new leaflet map um, centered in the center of this bounding box at a zoom level, and then we add the stamen layer, and we can you know change which layer we want to add here. Let me zoom in on this. People tend to like that. So we need to get our data. We have the um, airport data sort of hosted in this this GitHub repo, and uh, we grab the airports, we grab the uh, the points out of the airports, and then this view reset function is what renders the um, the D3 layer in the uh, actually I'm sorry. This will update the, the D3 layer in Leaflet. So it um, this is so that we can interact with zooming and stuff and re-render our um, SVG with the, the new coordinates to, to transform things. And then, oh yeah, so this does re-render um, our layer, actually. Uh, so we, we have a path you know, with our projector. So in this case, we're using... We made a custom function to project latitude, longitude points into x, y pixels because we're letting Leaflet take care of that instead of the D3 projections. So we just pass that to our path using the same path as before. And um, we're selecting all the circle airports. We're adding the features of the points that we got from the Topo JSON earlier over here. Then, uh, let's see, we append the circles, we give them a class. We just log log out their data when we click on them, so let's actually check that out. If I click on this guy over here, I see this object, this feature, it's got some properties. Here's the data I could access, right, if I, if I wanted to. Um, then I select all of the, the, this is, you know, creating new ones, and this is for um, just updating their position using the projection function and directly grabbing the coordinates out of um, the data. Then we render the table with that same data. We're selecting a table head, entering, adding rows, and then to each row we add a, a table um, a cell, and then uh, setting the text to be the property of that data. Uh, let's see. Then we're going through all the points. Oh, sorry. This was just the the head, uh, the header, because this is uh, looping over the keys. So these are all the properties that we see here, and that table is uh, down here somewhere. Oh, because I zoomed in. So yeah, we see at the top all the keys, and then these are the values of each row. Let's zoom in again. Where uh, for each row we loop through all the keys and um, or append a, a cell for each key and then uh, look up the properties at that cell. Uh, the other thing is we link it to the map by using on mouse over, and so we select all the circles that are highlighted and remove the highlight class, and then we select. Um, sorry, we set everything to, or we're selecting this row to highlight it. We're also selecting all the airports and filtering it where the data point for that airport circle matches the one for this table cell. And we're setting its class highlighted to true. And the class highlighted is up here, just makes uh, the stroke look bigger. So when we're uh, hovering around here, that gives us up. Oh, sorry, it's uh, covering uh, the table cells. It's uh, changing the, the airports. All right, that's pretty much this one. So I've been going for a little while here, but let's quickly just take a look at the source and see how this one's different. Um, most of the setup's the same, just a little, you know, styling the path instead of the circles. Uh, same 
uh, bounding box we're choosing a color scale to color the data based on uh, we're essentially saying between these two colors we're going to interpolate uh, with the HSL interpolation set the layer set the SVG um, drawing the view updating you know, rendering uh -huh. so every time we render um, we go through and get all the features of the path and we get out the property of the selected key. So the selected key is um, this here is like how we're um, determining the selected key. Uh, I'm just actually using D3 to make the drop down. But um, then we map map a path for each uh, tract, and we use the path's features for that. Um, so this is Topo JSON. We extract the features. Uh, create a path for each one. When we click, we log it. When we mouse over, we do the selection trick again. We highlight, uh, we de-highlight everything. And we highlight just this one, and then we fill or you know draw the path as usual with the, the SVG path. But here we're filling the, uh, we're setting the fill style, um, which is like an SVG thing, right? To um, use the color scale we defined earlier for the currently selected property. So this is like for this path's data, figure out what its color is, right? And so that that's why these are darker red because those numbers are bigger, and these uh, are the more yellow ones, and they're just smaller. Um, and then the table is the same. And yeah, this was part of this earthquake hackathon. Uh, I had some more examples uh, that some of them are a little slow to load, so you have to give them a second uh, because a lot of path data in this one actually is megabytes, I guess. Uh, but you know, you can see how to draw lines instead of polygons and color them uh, based on their um, data. And it's, they're still paths. I think it's just a matter of styling stroke, excuse me, instead. And uh, yeah, that's about it. All right, so that's it for part two. Um, hopefully this helped. Uh, you know, I enjoyed myself at map time. Uh, I think people there did too. So, you know, start making your own D3 maps. And in the next video, we'll do just that. I'll walk through step by step, writing out the code and making our own little map. All right, peace.